First, I want to thank um, the NSF for funding our project and my collaborators, many of them are here, and uh, there's some great folks and you'll get to hear from them shortly. Uh, the Morton Arboretum has been very supportive as well. Uh, Duke has also chipped in to help this project come together. And finally, I, I just met Guy Sternberg. It's been years, I've talked to him on the phone. I, I had the phone really far from my ear. <laughs> and, and Guy is amazing and his collections helped us really flesh out um, the material base for what I'd like to show you today. Uh, this is a typical collecting effort from my part of uh, the country in North Carolina and uh, it just gets me excited looking at these kinds of specimens. So today I'd like to just walk you through a couple of the things that have gotten me very excited and my colleagues about oaks and sort of puzzling out the tree of life for Quercus. I'll take you through a little bit of the early work, some of the names that you'll probably know, uh, some of the diversity, talk a little bit about the origins and relationships, um, we'll walk through the clades together. I think much of this will make sense because I think you guys know these species. I've never spoken to a group like this with as much knowledge about oaks and their diversity. So my goal is to basically just put that into context for you so you can appreciate the evolutionary relationships as we've uh, resolved them in our studies. Um, I'll present a little bit about classification because that reflects uh, sort of well on our efforts and it also comes back to where the early experts took their first stab at puzzling out oaks. And then biogeography is, is something really uh, dear to me and my passions for thinking about plant distributions. And the oak biogeography story is quite compelling. And then lastly, there's a nice story about American and Eurasian connections and the idea of the origin of the roboroid oaks and Quercus rober is a good poster species to think about in that context. So here we go. So if you think about the two great workers of, of Quercus worldwide, uh, in the Americas, it's William Trelease, worked in um, St. Louis, and then Amy Camus working in the old world in Paris. Together, they basically took apart this genus and tried to think about it. They were both evolutionists, so they had some understanding that went into describing these species. Camus took the whole genus on. Spectacular work from the mid-30s to the mid-50s. William Trelease focused on the American oaks, mostly um, just the three groups that I'll introduce to you. Um, and he really produced a tremendous monograph that might be on the shelf of, of many of you um, back at home. This is Trelease's diagram. It looks pretty tough to puzzle out these oaks, but he tried. And these arrows of connections, let me give you a little context to appreciate that. On the right of his diagram, those are the red oaks. Uh, oh, sorry about that, let me point to them. There they are. These are the red oaks here. Uh, his classification was based on series. So species alliances, what he thought were closely related, he gave names to those, many of those names. On the left, the white oaks. Down here, the golden cup oaks. Those are called protobalanus oaks. And then I just circled a couple of players that I will figure into where we're going today with the talk. Sadleriana, I'm talking about Quercus sadleriana from Western North America. And down here, one of our favorite groups, the virentes, the coastal live oaks. So those are the groups to think about as we go through the talk. So just a little introduction to warm you up uh, to get your um, blood flowing about oaks. Protobalanus, the golden cup oaks. We know them from Western US and Mexico. This is Quercus vaccinifolia, which is mostly under deep snowpack um, during uh, the winter months and the spring, as much as six to eight feet of snowpack. And that's the huckleberry oak. So there it is, a low growing Quercus shrub. Here's oaks from my neck of the woods. These are the lobati or the red oaks, um, strictly American. And these four species are closely related and they really look quite different in morphology. You might know the willow oak, which is widely planted, the water oak. This is a coastal endemic, Quercus incana, and Quercus pagoda, the cherry bark oak. So all of these things, showing all of these forms, actually quite closely related and that's some of what our work has discovered. 
If we think about the white oaks, I'll take you out west first to show you Quercus gariana, variety brewery, growing on the slopes here of Mendocino County, a really gorgeous oak, it's changing colors right there. Some of the distinctive things that were placed in the white oaks by Trelease. Quercus sadleriana here, the deer oak, look at the uh, simple teeth here, annual fruiting, and then the Virentes oaks, Quercus virginiana. It couldn't be more wide ranging in its form. This is Quercus virginiana growing on the dunes of North Carolina. This is Quercus virginiana, as many people know it, the way it occurs in wonderful cities like Savannah and Charleston. So tremendous variation in form. Those are the Virentes oaks. So I have to bring in our Eurasian group that connects to these American oaks, the Roboroids, and I chose Quercus infectoria here growing in Cyprus. And it's a wonderful prinoid-like oak. That's the leaf type, shallow lobing. You've seen something like this. Uh, all of you American oak enthusiasts, maybe Quercus montana, Quercus muhlenbergii. That's the kind of form, and I'll bring out that connection to you in a little bit. So, from the early traditional monographers, we moved more into the analytical phase of thinking about oaks. Kevin Nixon is really the preeminent expert on oaks, and he put together a classification based on principles of phylogeny. That is to have criteria to evaluate characters and to build an evolutionary tree or an evolutionary classification. So he chose to follow Camus, more or less, Cyclobalanopsis, subgenus Quercus, and then the sections of Quercus, Lobedi, Protobalanus, and Quercus. And he included Ceres and Ilex oaks. Those are the Eurasian groups that some of you know pretty well. I won't spend much time on those groups, but they're interesting in, in their own right. So along comes molecules. Early 80s, I started getting into this kind of thing. This bandwagon took me into thinking about how to get closer and closer to DNA sequence. And these are just some of the papers that have come along in the last 20 years that sort of got us closer and closer. Most of what I have to say today comes from this last round down here where Andrew Hip has spearheaded this group of us to think about getting the latest DNA sequence technology, basically taking snapshots from the nuclear genome, lots and lots of data to try and puzzle out the relationships of the oaks. So here's what we have. This is the origin and relationships of the major oak clades. There's two major groups. These we refer to as the American oak clade here. These are the old world groups, Ceres, Ilex, and Cyclobalanopsis. I have an approximate number of species in each group for you to appreciate. The size of those triangles is roughly proportional to that size. If we were thinking about the closest relatives of oaks. Right now, it would be possibly Nothalithocarpus, which is in Western North America, Castanian Castanopsis. Those are possible sister or close relatives of the oaks. So we think about a single origin of the oaks. But it might not be that way. And I'm just doing this to wake you guys up and also to add some wild speculation to the story. So could there be two origins for the oaks? Maybe so. Uh, the data really haven't been looked at closely enough. It might be that Nothalithocarpus is the closest relative to the American oak clade, and it could be that Castanian and Castanopsis are the closest relatives of the Old World clade. That's, that's really possible. Because, you know, making an acorn is pretty darn easy. These are all the groups that figured out how to make acorns. So where's the real acorn? Now, that's a puzzle for you guys to think about. So, we have something like the chestnut, three nuts in a cup. There's a little diagram. Castanopsis figured out how to make acorns. They're over in Southeast Asia. Lithocarpus makes acorns very well, 250 species or so of them. And then Quercus and Nothalithocarpus also make acorns. So I'll just leave that out there for you to think about. So let me focus on the American oak clades and I'll walk you through these. So we've got these five clades the low diversity clades here leading to Quercus with 150. These are the white oaks. Here's the Lobedi, the red oaks. So 
In terms of diversity, it's really interesting to think about where we see the hotspots for, for Quercus. Many of you already know that Mexico is the heartland of Quercus. If you want to see a lot of oaks, that's the place to go. Eastern North America, not too bad for the temperate oaks. The Southwest has some interesting diversity. And as you head down the spine of the Continental Divide here, you're going to get fewer and fewer oaks all the way down to the one red oak that crossed the Isthmus of Panama, Quercus humboldtii, standing out there alone in northern Colombia. There's one oak in Cuba, Quercus sangrina, which is a member of the Virentes group. So that's the picture of the American oaks with respect to their distribution and diversity. So here's the walk through the tree. So protobalanus. I worked on these for my dissertation. They're a great group, but really just five species. They stand out as being evergreen, truly evergreen oaks. Here they are on this landscape in Arizona, those dark um, trees there, Quercus chrysolepis, which is a really widespread oak throughout western North America and California, Arizona, and trickles down into Baja. This is Quercus palmeri, my favorite of the groups that, uh, of the species that has the holly-like look, and the early experts thought that these connected to some of the sclerophyllous oaks that we know from Eurasia. So that's protobalanus. Pontacy, this is one of the more exciting bits of our puzzle, and that our one species here in Western North America is closest relative is over near Turkey in um, Central Western Asia, and that's Quercus pontica. These species are nearly dead ringers for each other. They're the last of their kind, these two species. Wildly disjunct distribution, really interesting pattern of biogeography. So that's the Pontacea. Virentes is the next branch or the closest relatives of the white oaks. Trelis thought they were nested within the white oaks and related to them in some way. It seems like they're outside and the closest relatives of the white oaks. Their distribution is really interesting as well, trickling all the way down into Central um, America. Quercus virginiana here, and Quercus minima, one of my favorites, found on sand, a low-growing rhizomatous plant. And so these are the seven uh, species of Virentes. Uh, they're evergreen in some ways, yet they can be deciduous if they're growing in northern latitudes like Quercus virginiana. This is the white oaks. Uh, just a, a little taste of the diversity. I'll start with Quercus uh, John Tuckeri. This is near Palmdale, California, growing on sand. One of those scrubby white oaks that Victoria is going to tell us something about today. These are really tough oaks to try and sort out taxonomically. Their diversity is really uh, impressive as well. Quercus insignis has a widespread distribution and a fairly large nut, um, which makes it an impressive thing to take home from Mexico or wherever you might be. Quercus margaretti is showing the classic annual fruit maturation with this wonderful uh, lobing pattern. Here's a couple more oaks to think about. Quercus lobata in California. Um, Quercus oglethorpensis, probably the most recently described new species east of the Mississippi. Wilbur Duncan looked at that in the late 40s, presented it to Cornelius Muller, a shocking find of a new species at that stage of, of relative discovery in eastern North America. It was not mixed in with other species. It was brand new to science, really spectacular. Quercus rugosa, really widespread oak in um, the southwestern Americas and into Mexico. And it's pedunculate, as you can see, and its cotyledons are red at cross-section, which is a wonderful trait. So I don't expect you to read anything on the left, but I'm mostly going to impress you with how much we've learned from this new DNA technology that we've applied to the oaks. We've sorted out these species into alliances, and this is basically my new approach at, at taking on the Trelis series, but obviously I'm recognizing fewer series, and I'm naming these clades, those groups that share a common ancestor and all the descendants. Here are the Roboroids from Eurasia. There's about 20 of them moving into the New World. The Lobatoids, those are California, Albi, Montana, Alba and Mishoei, Prinoid, Stelady, 
polymorphy, which is possibly five species, maybe more. And then really the big puzzle still is how the white oaks of Mexico and further south um, fit together. This is the most recent explosion of species diversity, and it's probably going to be the hardest challenge for uh, the future of thinking about oaks. So the story is mostly the temperate groups are really neat and easy to uh, puzzle out. The tropical groups, more difficult. That theme will be um, obvious again when I present the red oaks. And here they are. So the lobate. Biennial fruit maturation, most of the time. Some of them produce their fruit annually. Quercus rubra, Quercus marilandica, one of my favorites. Quercus wislazenii, very interesting, showing uh, the interesting long styles that we know from the red oaks. Here's Quercus levis, uh, festooned with uh, bromeliad on the coast of North Carolina. And once again, we have the data to really puzzle out these relationships within that smear of red oak diversity. Starting first, agrifolia, the California red oaks, only four species. Quercus palustris and Quercus texana, just two species make up a clade called palustri. Coccinii, and I added the resolution here because Andrew is part of this. Quercus coccinia, elopsoidalis, the hills oak, and volutina. We have the data to show that as a subgroup of species that are related relative to rubra and this group that is more or less known as the Schumardii kind of red oaks. So the DNA has some really good resolving power here. Laurifolii, mostly a southeastern group of red oaks. And then again, this sort of wonderful diversity of Mexican red oaks that we have just started to um, scratch the surface of. So how about the idea of the oak distribution meeting the phylogeny and what, what does it all say? So the first thing we might think about is that Protobalanus and Virentes might have had an origin in the New World and here is the extent of their movement. They are New World endemic groups. The Pontici, one species here, one species here. Obviously, these are the endpoints of what might have been a more widespread group of oaks gone through uh, rounds of extinction, leaving just these two relic species. The red oaks, another new world group. The early branches of this evolutionary tree of red oaks seems to be in the temperate zone with one branch heading down into Central America. And that theme is repeated with the white oaks heading down into Central America, but also moving across to the old world. And I'll come back to that movement to the old world in a second. So here are all those paths of movement and diversification. The role of hybridization is something oak enthusiasts have always been concerned with. I don't have a whole lot to say other than hybridization has not really affected the results of our study. That said, I want to tell you one little story about some deeper, more ancient hybridization that plays a role in what we have from the data. And it has to do with the roboroids. Here they are. This is the extent of their distribution, 15 to 20 species in Eurasia. I think we have one on the back of our dime. Is anyone aware of that? Is it Quercus rober? I, I think there could be a movement to change the oak on the back of the dime if, if anyone here wants to go there. But anyway, um, we have Quercus rober here, Quercus griffithii, which is from China. These are annual fruiting white oaks with the classic prinoid-like leaf. This is the look of oaks that we know in North America, such as Quercus montana, Michoei, Muhlenbergii, Prinoides. You know these oaks that have that leaf type. So some of the early experts really believed that there was a connection between those groups. A good thing for us to look at with our data. So one thing that has come up is the paleobotanists have started to look at the distribution of oaks using some new places to look for fossils. And this paper came out in 2010 that talked about a land bridge connecting um, from the new world to the old world and some data that was suggestive that it was the white oaks that had taken this little overland sort of migration at the right time when climate was favorable to go from west to east. 
fossils at high latitudes actually look like some of those prinoid oaks that I've been showing you um, in a few previous slides. So here's the, the pattern that's most important. Here's the New World white oaks, and I'm just putting Quercus sadleriana in there, and here's the Eurasian white oaks, and I'm putting Quercus pontica there. That's the distribution that I want you to think about with respect to the origin of the roboroids. Now, this is a data slide, and I'll make it very simple for you. This is looking at the data in a very different way, mostly in a pairwise way of trying to look at not just phylogenetic relationships, but what are the similarities in some of these bits of DNA? When we looked at Quercus pontica, which is in orange, Quercus pontica on this side of this diagram finds itself to be sort of highly related to each other, which makes sense. Second a group that it's most closely related to is Sadleriana, which makes sense. They're each other's closest relatives. As you step down, it's all Quercus Rober and its friends that it seems to have some very close genetic affinities with. If you look at Quercus sadleriana, similar, it's closest to itself, then to Pontica, and then to a smear of New World Oaks, which is mostly what we think is kind of background noise. But this pattern is pretty interesting right there. So one idea is that we think that maybe the roboroid oaks fit into this group of New World white oaks, that they fit in right there where we expected them based on leaf type and some of the fossil data. As we've built the phylogenies, this gene flow, when the roboroids hit the Pontica group, moves them down to this position. This has biogeographic implications, but also an interesting scenario of these oaks meeting, the roboroids meeting what was there in the old world and possibly something that it was compatible with it at the level, the genetic compatibility to hybridize and swap genes. Wild speculation, but the data look pretty good. So, let me wrap this up and tell you a few stories um, about what we've found. We've got eight major clades worldwide of oaks. We just named the clades. I'm not too concerned about building a rank order classification right now. I think just naming those clades and using those to communicate with each other is really important as we move forward. The oaks of the Americas sort out into five of those clades. That's Protobalanus, Pontice, Virentes, Quercus, the white oaks, and Lobate, the red oaks. The resolution of the temperate diversity is really um, robust right now with respect to the data. We need more work on the Mexican oaks, and I've been talking to Tonio and others about how to really get at these problems, and it's gonna take sampling and a real understanding on the ground of how um, the, the oaks of Mexico to look at those species concepts and, and bring that knowledge into the next round of analyses. It also seems that the American oaks originated at middle to higher latitudes, diversified into those low diversity groups that I showed you, and then took this walk down into Central America. So there's parallel radiations of red and white oaks into the tropics, and that's an interesting biogeographic story. And then lastly, the idea that the roboroids originated in the Americas, migrated to the old world over that North Atlantic land bridge, probably somewhere like 10 million years ago. And when they got there, they met the ancestral Pontice, where only Quercus pontica is, is the last living species of that. And that hybridization and introgression obscures the relationships that we've been trying to reconstruct with our DNA methods. I want to thank you all for your attention. It was a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much.